Hopefully you've grabbed a Bible which is in front of you this morning. We're going to look at this passage, or at least the first few verses of uh, the passage that we read together. <clears throat> Over the, the past number of weeks, we have been thinking about aspects of Jesus in his humanity and just thinking, maybe taking the, the lead from Hebrews 12, verse 3, uh, consider Jesus the man who, who did lots of things um, as per the, the side verse. And we know that Jesus was that. He exemplified those things and he did those things for a reason and for a purpose so that we might, might know him, that we might be encouraged to keep going as, as followers and, and as Christians. But so often I think it's really difficult to, to really have a, a concrete grasp of who Jesus really was and is. But I mean, it's the passage of time Never mind anything else, it's a couple of thousand years uh, since Jesus was on the, uh, was on the earth. And uh, those things then can feel very remote from us. And sometimes it's, it's really, really hard to think that this is real. And we struggle with that and we, we wonder at times, particularly when we go through difficulties and uh, is this real, does this really add up and we've got all our doubts and all those things are, that are there. So just want to try and, and we tease a little bit out of that today as we've been thinking of various aspects. Today, if there's a title over everything, it is this, think about Jesus as the man who perhaps throws down a challenge to us, a challenge about what we really think about Jesus and who Jesus really is. And to try and make this understanding of who Jesus is real, I think that might be some of the reasoning or the encouragements why some people might want to go out to what is referred to as the Holy Land. And I know that we have a team uh, going out to do some practical work uh, with Lyft, and they'll be um, going out and, and they've been there before. And quite often, if you've been to Israel and you've seen many of the places, sometimes it can be a little bit of a disappointment for you in some regards, because no matter how passionately certain individuals may believe that Jesus really was on this spot, and that Jesus really was here, and that while he was here, he did X and Y and Z, because of what they've actually built around that spot, what has now, what's now come to be in that place, and it's probably some very ornate church, and uh, it's a very elaborate church with lots of icons and lots of other things that actually put you off in the end, and you wonder, why do you get so excited about this, and and then you think probably wasn't even here at the end of the day and you sort of walk away a bit disconsolate about it. But there are other areas where you know that actually they can't change very much. And one of those areas might be, for instance, the Sea of Galilee. Because you go and you look at the Sea of Galilee and you imagine you can see the hillside around and about that. You can see the water and you can see little boats out on that. And when you're there and you see that, you have a, you have a sense that actually that this was something very, very close to what Jesus in his humanity, with Jesus with human eyes, actually looked out and this is what Jesus saw. And you can't take that away. You can't change that. And so you, there's, a, there's a sense of connection. Uh, another place, and again, when I was out a long, long time ago, uh, I, I would have seen this area as well and being impacted uh, Save Galilee had a big impact upon me, but this other one, uh, and this is the one that's actually mentioned in the Bible passage that we've read today. This is Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Philippi, it's not the Caesarea on the coast, just in case you've got a, a Bible atlas uh, at the back of, of your Bible. This one, uh, Caesarea Philippi, is at the foot of Mount Hermon, and it's a, a very unique place. It's an ancient place. And what you're looking at is, again, pretty much, well, a lot of us may have been taken away over the years, but the essence of what Jesus was looking at is there in front of you. And Jesus would have been looking at that. His disciples would have been looking at that. Uh, that image has sort of gone in quite close, but down below the, the picture, as it were, south of that, uh, there would be a lot of water because there, there would have, there's a lot of shallow water there. 
and uh, the shallow waters there because this is one of the, the, the sources of the, the River Jordan. But the other thing that really gets your attention when you're there is all those arch, arches that are chiseled in to the, the cliff side, as it were, there. And there's also lots of statues that would have been chiseled out of the cliff. And that would have been there when Jesus was there. And that's what Jesus would have been looking at when he was there. And when you look at that area, what is apparent in this area of Caesarea Philippi is that this is an area where superstition is rife. This is an area where there was lots of people who had lots of different thoughts about God. And lots of gods, or so-called gods, were worshipped in this place. And the very origin of it all goes back to the nature god Pan. So this is long before Jesus would have been there. And before this place was renamed by this emperor, the Caesar Philip, in his own name. That's why you've got Caesarea Philippi. But before it was called that, it was called Panias, from the nature god Pan. And it's from Pan, leading to panic. We get our word panic from, which means a superstitious fear, an irrational fear. So that's where that all comes from. So that's the background to this place. It's a place where lots of gods or so-called gods are worshipped. It's pagan. It's lots of superstition. And actually, the far left-hand side of that picture, you'll see like the entrance to a cave. And before Jesus' time, at Jesus' time, that was believed to be the entrance to hell itself. That's the gateway to hell. So it's a fitting environment for Jesus to look at his disciples and saying, around and about us, guys, there are lots of people's views about what God really is and who God really is. And you can see that lots of people have lots of ideas. And so he asks the question in verse 13. He says, who do the people say the Son of Man is? In other words, in this place where lots of people have views about God, what are the people actually saying about me? And as you read on into verse 14, they're simply throwing back to him some of the thoughts that people currently then had about Jesus. One of them was that John the Baptist, they knew that he had been beheaded, he had been killed, but he was such a significant person that surely people were thinking he's bound to come back at some point and perhaps Jesus is now the new John the Baptist. And other people would have said, no, no, it's not that. It's Elijah was a really significant Old Testament person and there's the thought that Elijah was going to come back and he was going to be uh, the forerunner and the one who was going to be the Messiah in that sense. Maybe it's maybe you're Elijah. And other people, again, maybe not just so certain, were saying, well, he's certainly significant. He's certainly like an Old Testament prophet. Perhaps, perhaps he's someone like Jeremiah or certainly some of the other prophets. So that's what the people were thinking about Jesus. That's the notions that people had about Jesus. But Jesus, again, he's not so concerned about that. And again, being aware of where they're standing, where there's lots of talk about the gods and views uh, about who or what God is. He's looking at his disciples and he's saying, look, I'm not really even concerned about what the people, the crowd say about me because look at verse 15. And Jesus asks this big question. Perhaps this is the sense even for us that we've got this question. I don't care about anyone else. What about you? He asked, who do you say I am? And I think that is our pertinent question, isn't that? Because really it doesn't make any difference what other people think about Jesus. The crucial thing is what sort of answer do we give to that question? Because a right profession, a right speaking about Jesus is really critical. For instance, if I was to read from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. If you declare with your mouth 
Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So it's important to believe and to say the right things about Jesus and what we certainly understand about Jesus and who he is. I mean, Jesus isn't simply a messenger, but Jesus is the very message from God. He's not simply uh, the evangelist. He is the very incarnation of the evangel. He, He embodies the whole message of what he is. And that's why when we understand who Jesus is, the Bible says he is the image of the invisible God. What you can't really picture about God, that's who and that's what Jesus is. And so we have been thinking over this past number of weeks about aspects of Jesus in his humanity. He was a man, a man who preached truth. He was the man who defeated Satan. He was the man who defeated death. He's the man who today we're thinking that he's throwing down a challenge as to what we actually think about him. He's saying, you've got to come and you've got to follow me. And maybe that leads out with certain propositions from this passage. Because I've been thinking, it's hard when notions of Jesus can be so remote to make them real and concrete. And perhaps to have this idea that What we read in the Bible, what we understand in the Bible actually is if you see Jesus. I know for us it's what we read. But the Bible would say it's enough to believe, even though we haven't seen him. But when we see Jesus in that sense of what we have learned about him, you actually see God. Because it is really hard. You read in the Bible notions like God is love, God is light, God is truth. And yet it's very difficult to see those things as concrete expressions. And it's hard then to place your trust in a God whom you sort of have these notions that he's love, he's light, he's, he's truth. But what does it actually look like? But when we have an understanding that Jesus is the embodiment of these things and that these things are an expression of what God really is, then we understand that actually when we see Jesus in that sense of understanding who Jesus is, that we actually see God himself. And that the attributes of God have their highest ideal in Jesus. So when we see Jesus dealing with people in the pages of the Bible, when we see him reaching out and touching people, when we see him in compassion, holding on to people and lifting people, drawing alongside people, These are actually an expression of what it means to to be God. And so Jesus is God in human flesh. And that's important, I think, because when we're struggling, when we find it really hard, we need to remind ourselves that actually God is not remote. God is not unlike us, but God is human. Jesus was God in human flesh. The word became flesh, John chapter 1 reminds us. And that means that whenever we're struggling, whenever we're going through difficulties, whenever we find it hard, we need to go back and understand that Jesus understands because he was a human like we are. And seeing Jesus then in that sense is to see God. But maybe to go a little further with that, actually to find that trusting Jesus that we actually find and encounter God. The more that we get to know God, the more that our minds are blown and we have a sense of who he really is. It's like I think the first time, maybe you've got your first smartphone, whatever it was, and you compare that to the old Nokia bricks or whatever you used to have, and apologies if that's still what you're using. Uh, But remember the first time you got one of these phones and then you suddenly realized, wow, this can do this. And then it can do something else. And it can also do the other thing. And it's just like your, your mind has really been blown away and, and enlarged and this sense of what this little thing can do. And that's our understanding the more that we actually encounter Jesus. And the more that you see in the pages of the Bible the human Jesus and what he did and what he, what he represents and what he shows to us is that it's This is all who God is. And it just gives us this greater sense of amazement that our God is like this and that 
than trusting Jesus lets me see this and I can find God if I want to know who God is. I look at Jesus. And then to go a little further with that, that actually when I begin to follow Jesus, I begin to please God. Now, we know today that there are lots of views out there about what Jesus actually was. We have a very strong belief that Jesus is God. I've been saying that. Fully human, fully fully divine. Not everyone, of course, believes that. But we do know that Jesus was verifiably on the earth. It's a historic fact. You cannot get away or around that. There was a person who was written about and there is so much written about him, so you have to deal with that. So there is certainly someone called Jesus, and he lived at a certain time in, in history, and he impacted certain people's lives, and he, and he was there. And then going beyond that as well, I think almost nearly universally accepted is the notion that actually Jesus left a wonderful example. A wonderful example that we can follow. Like nearly everyone, of course, would believe that. Now, I'm not going to go as far as to say that if you try your best and simply follow that example, that you will be saved because that's not what it's about because we could never do it perfectly. And that's all part and parcel of Jesus is the only one who was perfect and the only one who could do it. And it's his perfection that we look to and that was all done for us. But... When we become Christians and when we follow Jesus, we will then, of course, want to imitate Jesus and do the things that Jesus did and those examples that he left us. And it's a consequence of having Jesus in your life. And I think we do need to ask ourselves at times, am I pleasing God? in what I'm doing. Now we decide what we're going to do. I'm going to go such and such a place. It almost sounds like the, uh, the rich farmer and he was building his barns and making bigger and bigger barns and he was going to decide I'm, I'm going to do X, Y and Z. We don't know of course what we're going to do but we should be asking God in what I'm going to do, what's possibly in front of me, am I pleasing God with my conduct prior to any action or course of action to check my motivation? To follow Jesus, to please God, to imitate Jesus, to actually then that we actually serve God. As I was saying I think over this past couple of weeks as well, we could never do that in our own strength. We could never serve Jesus fully. We can never do exactly what we want to do. We will always fall on our, on our faces. But that's the wonder of the gospel, that Jesus accepts us as we are. And he enables us to do what we can in his strength for his glory. And maybe just thinking then today in this passage, as there is something here that reaches out to us. And there is something here about Jesus, and we have been learning a lot about Jesus over this past number of weeks, but what does it really mean to us? Because Jesus isn't concerned what the person beside you thinks about him. He's not concerned about the whole crowd, as it were. He's not concerned about the society and our culture as a whole. But he wants to know what do you say about me? Who do you think I am? Because there are a variety of notions, depending on where we come from. Reminded of a story I read a little while ago about someone who was buying a new house and it was in one of these developments with open plan lawns and gardens in front. And the the question the new owner had, and he was asking one of the people who was already in that development, and he says, where are the boundaries out here for the gardens? And the response was, well, that depends upon whether you're talking owning or mowing. 
Now, we can have a range of views about things that don't really matter. But when it comes to Jesus, and remembering in this image, even as I had just a a few moments ago about that place, a place where there were so many thoughts about what God really was. And it's in that place that Jesus throws down, throws out this challenge. I don't care what other people think. Who do you say that I am? And then when we've made our decision about that, and if we believe as the scriptures tell us that Jesus is someone so significant, so important, so important and if Jesus has died for us that we might have life and life in all its fullness and and that we will want to follow that will mean changes for us inevitably as we're trying to imitate and as we're trying with his help to trust him and follow him what will that and how will that impact our lives going from this day Perhaps there's a little video clip I could ask to be played at this point just before we play our, sing our last song. We can trust, team can come up, we can trust following Jesus because in essence we know that he is good and he has good plans in store for us, but it's the very nature of who he is. And never mind what other people think, it's what he has told us about himself.